Well, good morning and welcome to the Justice Committee's first meeting of 2017. We have apologies from John Finney. Agenda item number one is decision on taking an item in private and the decision is whether to take item three in private, which is consideration of the committee's draft report to the Finance Committee on the Scottish Government's draft budget 2017-18. Are we all agreed? Thank you for that. Agenda item number two is an evidence session for the Crown and Procurator Fiscal Service Inquiry. And it's my pleasure to welcome Michael Matheson, Cabinet Secretary for Justice, to the meeting along with Neil Rennick, Director of Justice, and Willie Cowan, Deputy Director of the Criminal Justice Division. And Cabinet Secretary, I wish you and your officials a very happy new year. Now, I understand um, that you don't want to make an opening statement, um, Cabinet Secretary, so I merely refer members to papers one and two and invite questions, starting with Oliver Mundell, then Stuart Stevenson, and followed by Rona. Uh, thank you. I'd like to just start by asking you whether you feel uh, and are satisfied that the Crown Office and Procurator's Fiscal Service is adequately funded. Well, um, first of all, can I just wish all the committee members a, a happy new year and I look forward to working with you over the course of the year. Um, as you'll be aware, the budget for the Crown Office is a budget which is directly negotiated by the Lord Advocate uh, with the uh, Finance Secretary. Um, uh, as far as I'm aware from the evidence that you've received from the Lord Advocate and his evidence to the committee just before Christmas, he believes that the budget is adequate for him to be able to fulfil the functions in delivering an effective and efficient uh, fiscal and uh, current office service uh, and to meet the public's expectations of those particular services. And uh, in that sense, I believe it is an adequate budget to be able to deliver the services that it requires to do. So uh, where, where then do you think the concerns the committee's heard from a range of different witnesses come from around the lack of adequate resources, delays, uh, cases not making it to trial because uh, they've gone past uh, deadlines, uh, you know, actual fiscal's been, been under, you know, an awful lot of strain and, uh, and pressure uh, and, and very high absence rates in, in the service. Uh, well, there will be a whole variety of reasons as to why some of these things may happen. Uh, it won't all be based on finance in itself. Um, having said that, recognised finance will play a part in that. Uh, the uh, cash settlement for the Crown Office uh, for the forthcoming financial year is the same as the cash settlement they have for this financial settlement, this financial year, both for revenue and for capital costs. Um, uh, they will obviously have to find efficiencies within their budgets to be able to meet any in-year financial demands as uh, well. But there are a whole range of factors. It's a, uh, I think to simply equate all of these issues down to purely being a financial matter is overly simplistic. Um, uh, but there will be uh, challenges that the uh, service will have to meet and the Lord Advocate will need to take them forward in the way that he best thinks that can be achieved within the service. Yeah. As uh, Justice Secretary, do you recognise there is a resourcing issue within the service? Well, I, I recognise that there's challenges right across the public sector in managing their budgets effectively as possible. Um, but as you've heard from the evidence you've got from the Lord Advocate um, just before Christmas, that he believes the budget's adequate to be able to deliver the services that he requires. So where then do you think uh, the concerns that we are hearing from other witnesses who are uh, interacting with the service on a day-to-day -day basis are coming from? What, do, you, do you think that they're all historic? Do you think that... Which particular, uh, which particular issues? Well, round the burden that uh, fiscals are under, that, uh, that they're being asked to, to cope with too high a workload, uh, concerns from uh, defence... Uh, practitioners that uh, things are not working as well as they used to in the past, uh, that cases are going to trial that are not properly prepared, uh, that uh, we're seeing you know, delays in some cases uh, well, that mean that those trials aren't even able to go forward. Well, uh, it would be a matter for the Lord Advocate to explain how the Crown Office deal with some of these issues because it, it's an area of his responsibility and how, how the Crown Office deals with these, these particular issues. Uh, issues relating to individual cases and how they manage cases. Uh, but overall, uh, some of the challenges which the Crown Office face today um, are no different to some of the challenges they've faced for an extended period of time. 
I don't underestimate the challenges that fiscals face in terms of their workload and the demands which are placed upon them uh, and some of the challenges that go with that. But uh, as an organisation, broadly, they manage these things as effectively and efficiently as they can. But how that is to be taken forward internally within the organisation is a matter for the Lord Advocate. Thank you. And coming to the session, I pressure a little bit more than that. It impacts on... It victims, it impacts on witnesses, it impacts really on the, the criminal justice system, the whole churn of it. So there is a wider view here than, than merely looking, I think, at is the, the Lord Advocate satisfied that he can manage with the resources? Um, do you have con some concerns about some of the, the evidence, which frankly I think is deeply concerning that we've heard from various witnesses across the board. Well, I think it's important that we always look at the justice system as a whole system approach. So uh, the way in which our courts operate, the way in which our uh, Crown Office operates, the police, other parts of the justice system, how they operate collectively is extremely important. And that's the uh, work that's taken forward by the, the Justice Board and looking at how they can coordinate and cooperate effectively to manage the challenges which they uh, face and to make sure that they are operating in a collaborative way as well. That includes uh, looking at victim services, how victim services are provided as well, how we can improve the system to reduce uh, some, of the, uh, some of the challenges that victims can face as a result of the uh, way in which uh, the justice system operates. There are still some very significant areas where we can improve, although there have been marked improvements, significant improvements in uh, recent uh, years, which I'm sure uh, the member will recognise. Is there more to do? Yes, there is more to do. Uh, uh, right across the justice system, uh, not just within the Crown Office and how our fiscal service uh, operates. Uh, but by and large, uh, there have been uh, significant improvements made for how we deal with victims in a whole range of different ways. Um, uh, and we want to build on that moving forward. You know, if I can give you a, a, a practical example of where I think we can help to reduce uh, the, the challenges that some victims can face, particularly children and vulnerable witnesses. In the uh, procedure and evidence review, I think there's been, been a very compelling case made about the need to change the way in which we deal with uh, witnesses and victims uh, in these circumstances. And we are keen to look at how we can take that forward. And some of that will probably involve legislative change in Scotland. So um, uh, I think it'd be unfair to characterise the system as one that's not improved, has improved. Is there more to be done? Yes, there's more to be done, but the best way in which to do that is to look right across the system to make sure that uh, victims and witnesses, right from the uh, stages when they come into contact with the police all the way through the justice system, are getting the support and the assistance that they require. Well, since you've mentioned victim support, and I hadn't intended to bring that up too much later in the questioning then, um, there's a real concern that victim support funding has, has run out. And in fact, the committee has been written to by the Moira Fund expressing real concerns that the victim of homicide just aren't being supported. And this despite them <coughs> giving £5,000 this financial year and £5,000 mm. last financial year. Um, our fund for serious crime seems to be depleted and there isn't any separate representation or... or um, allowance for people who have been the, the victims or the families who have suffered um, the most heinous crime that a family can suffer, and that's homicide. Do you have a comment on that? Yeah, I'm more than happy to look into the specific issue that, that, that you've raised. Um, uh, we, we provide over £5 million a year to Victim Support Scotland that provide services at a national level. Uh, at, right across the country. Alongside that, we also provide funding to organisations such as PETO, uh, that work with individuals who um, have uh, uh, suffered uh, a homicide. Uh, so we provide uh, funding to a range of organisations that uh, operate both at a national and a local level in uh, supporting uh, victims. As I said before, is if there's more we can do, then we should always look to do that. Um, uh, but the specific issue that the Moira Fund has raised with you, I'm more than happy to take that away and to uh, look into it. If it's a, the Victims Fund, that's a fund which is uh, provided by uh, Victim Support Scotland on our behalf, uh, which is to provide some financial support to 
uh, victims uh, in the immediate aftermath of um, a particular uh, crime to if they're at financial loss and financial difficulty as a result. Um, uh, but we, uh, our funding to these areas has been pretty consistent over uh, recent years. And uh, as I said, though, but we're always looking to see if there's ways in which we can improve that and to ensure that we're meeting the needs of victims as best we can. OK, I'll let others come in, but just to say that they say they've worked very closely in England, and it works in England throughout <coughs> Scotland as well, uh, with the homicide support um, in England and Wales. They've got homicide caseworker, and um, support for victims of homicide continues for 12 to 18 months. If additional um, finance is needed, then it's available. And in particular, um, the Moira Fund, a national, very small charity, handful of unpaid um, volunteers formed after um, the death of Moira Jones, brutally murdered in Glasgow in 2008. Mm. But the particular point that her mother, who started the fund, is alarmed about is that the, the VF, the Victim Fund, is depleted now before the end of December 2016. Then she's really uh, raising a, a very legitimate concern about where that leaves anyone else who unfortunately finds themselves in that devastating situation for the next three months of the financial year. So happy to, to pass on that correspondence, um, Cabinet Secretary. Yeah, if you do, and I, I, we can check that with Victim Support Scotland to run the Victims Fund for us uh, to provide that financial support to individuals and families. And we can come back to the committee with uh, for the details on that once we've dis discussed it with them. Right, thank you for that. Um, Stuart, followed by Ron. Uh, thank you very much. <coughs> Good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Um, in your initial answer, you <coughs> used the word deficiencies, uh, and you also referred to the procedure, procedure and the evidence review. Um, I think an outside observer looking at how our courts run uh, would recognise if there were in a court 200 years ago, basically the same basic structure and system and approach that we have. Um, I just wonder, given the appetite that we know there is in the Crown Office and Fiscal Service, and indeed in your own office, and in the Lord Advocate's office generally, um, whether the use of technology to avoid people having to physically attend court, whether radical changes that can be made to the processes uh, will actually benefit the operational efficiency of the system um, and, and make it run slicker and faster and, of course, ultimately uh, uh, more cost-effectively. Uh, how are we placed to uh, pick up that particular challenge and uh, move the courts forward to something um, that makes better use of the opportunities technology in particular might bring us? Well, there's no doubt that... Uh, technological development can support us in improving efficiencies within the uh, justice system. I think the uh, challenge in all of these areas is in applying uh, uh, technology to them is to make sure that it's not just about the actual hardware in itself, it's also about the cultural change which is necessary within uh, organisations. So, for example, um, one of the areas that um, uh, we've been uh, uh, taken forward over recent years is uh, the use of CCTV links uh, between our prisons and uh, courts. Now, all of our prisons now have those facilities in place. Uh, we've also got uh, arrangements where, um, uh, for first callings where individuals are in police custody, where there could be CCTV links with the, uh, the courts. However, there are well, some legal limitations in the circumstances in which these could be it used and uh, for those uh, 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 convener will recall from the criminal justice uh, bill uh, criminal justice act now there were provisions made which allow us to extend the nature of cases that can now actually be dealt with through cctv that in itself reduces the need for individuals to be transported uh, and taken to court and allows the court time to use much more efficiently um, as uh, well so there are Benefits like that, uh, would you call it, which we are taking forward and we're keen to make progress on, and that all comes as part of our digital strategy, uh, which again operates in a pan-justice basis. Uh, 
there are further areas where there can be improvements, uh, I believe, in the future, where technology could uh, assist us uh, further. So, for example, um, I mentioned in the procedure and evidence review, particularly around children and vulnerable witnesses, one of the areas I said I believe there's a very compelling case is about the, uh, uh, the uh, proposal for uh, pre-recorded evidence, uh, which reduces the trauma uh, for children in particular. Uh, and for vulnerable witnesses, where that evidence is captured uh, and it's then agreed and it is then played in court uh, without the need for individuals to go through a cross-examination uh, in the way in which they would uh, normally be expected to do so. Uh, the challenge is in taking some of that forward, is trying to do that in terms of balancing the rights between uh, the needs of uh, victims and witnesses alongside that of the accused. Uh, to having their rights protected as well. However, other jurisdictions have been able to do so, and I believe we uh, should be able to do so. Uh, an important element of that, though, is about creating a culture change within our justice system to agree that that's the type of approach that we should take that could affect better outcomes uh, for victims and for our uh, justice system. So that's using technology in a way. Another area where I think uh, technology could uh, uh, support and assist us in uh, improving efficiency within the justice system is through uh, the use of uh, body-worn cameras by uh, police officers. Uh, there's no doubt that um, information which could be captured in that way could be, uh, at times I suspect once it's been shared with uh, uh, defence agents, uh, may result in <coughs> earlier pleas being entered. Uh, uh, on the basis of information that's been captured by that. It would be evidence that the court could consider much more efficiently and effectively as well. Um, but it's not just a case of providing uh, our police officers to have body-worn cameras. It's also about making sure that we've got the technology both at a Crown Office fiscal level to be able to download that, to be able to then share that with uh, defence agents and then for that to then be used in courts as well. So it's about that, again, that whole system approach. If we're going to apply some additional technological developments in our courts or in our police service, is to make sure that they're all able to interact and to be able to maximise their use. And a key part to that is about the culture shift, which is extremely important. So, um, so the digital strategy which we've set out is very ambitious in looking to take that type of technological advancement forward for the efficiencies that it will generate. Um, uh, but that will be one which we need to take forward in a, a very systematic fashion to make sure we get the best gains from it uh, as we move it forward. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, you brought the word effectiveness into that answer as well as efficiency. Um, given that we've now got a couple of classes of witnesses, children and vulnerable witnesses, who are using technology to give their evidence, reducing the stress, making their experience one that is more easily accommodated by them. Is that something, therefore, that tells us that that's a benefit that could reasonably be delivered to all witnesses and make the whole process more effective for them, less stressful, make witnesses more comfortable about coming forward to give evidence? as well as the operational benefits. And perhaps from all of that that we've been talking about here, uh, are we in a position to give any early indication of perhaps a sequence of, of things that might happen that will start to address this or even a timetable? Well, look, there's a, there's a number of different things in there. I think, first of all, um, I set it very clearly around the children and vulnerable witnesses. This is an area where I want to see progress and early progress. Um, uh, some of that progress can be taken forward through some uh, uh, changes to court process. Uh, however, other parts will require legislative change um, as well. And I'm keen in this parliamentary session to bring forward legislation which will give effect to that. What we have to do is identify the model that best works for us. Uh, so, for example, we know that uh, when it comes to children and vulnerable witnesses, and for example, in Scandinavia, they've got a particular approach, and then there are uh, other jurisdictions that have taken different approaches to dealing with these uh, issues. Uh, what I want to do is to make sure that we've got a model that best fits uh, the Scottish justice system and delivers uh, the same type of protections and support to uh, vulnerable uh, and child witnesses. So that's an early area uh, where I think we can make progress on. Uh, once we've taken that forward, I think there's an opportunity then to look at other areas within uh, our court system for it to be expanded potentially to other uh, groups of witnesses and uh, victims. But 
I think we need to take it forward on an incremental basis to make sure that we manage that type of change effectively. When you ask me about uh, other areas, uh, and our parts are uh, not always necessarily about technology, it's also about the model which we are using within our uh, justice system. And the evidence and procedure review also sets out a very compelling case, particularly around uh, summary cases, about the need to remodel the system to allow us to deal with those cases much more effectively. And a key part of that is to reduce some of the uh, churn for witnesses in these cases. Uh, and that's an area which the Lord President has set out as a, an area, area of priority that he wants to see progress being taken forward on. Uh, so there's already work through the Justice Board in looking at uh, taking that work forward. Uh, uh, it's already started uh, in looking at that, and we'll look to see how we can make further progress in that in the weeks and months ahead. So I think there is... Uh, technology can offer us efficiencies, but it's also about some of the models uh, and processes which we use within the existing system, which the Procedure and Evidence Review uh, uh, also sets out as a, a, an area where we need to make progress. And the Lord President is very clear that that's a, an area of priority for him as well, which again would help to reduce some of the burden on uh, uh, witnesses in being called to cases. Thank you. Rona? Thank you, Convener. Uh, yes, my question was actually about um, making the justice system less traumatic for children, and the Cabinet Secretary has actually answered all the questions that I had, so that's fine. Thank you. Okay, uh, Douglas. Thank you. Uh, Can I ask, Cabinet Secretary, um, how many jobs do you anticipate being lost in the Crown Office as a result of the Scottish Government's real term cuts this year? Uh, well, uh, I'm not expecting any at the present time. It would be a matter for the Lord Advocate to no, say it. What I is. understand that. The Lord Advocate has suggested it will be uh, cuts. And I just wonder, given the figures that he used at his evidence session, which you said you watched, what is your prediction of the numbers that that will equate to in the Crown Office? I said I watched. You said you had heard his evidence. From, yeah, yeah. I, re I read the evidence, yeah. yes. So, uh, but it would be for the Lord Advocate to say it, what his, uh -huh, his staffing level will be. the figures that he's got to save, and I just wonder, as a Scottish Government Minister, what your prediction is for the numbers that would equate to the figures he has to save. It would be for the Lord Advocate to set that out. And you're not worried about what those figures are? Uh, well, I'm confident the Lord Advocate has got a budget that he believes he can deliver an efficient and effective but service. But he has to lose staff in, as in a result In the evidence that, that you heard from the Lord Advocate, he said it was very much in line with what they were modelling and planning for. Do, do you know how much he's got to save in staff? Uh, how much he's got to save in staff? Uh -huh. it, it'll be for him to determine no, that. No, but he already said that, so you didn't pick that up from the evidence uh, session. Well, I picked up the details he's got in terms of his budget, mm -hmm. but it'll be for him to determine what that will be in terms of staffing going forward. But he said at our budget, to, to maybe help you out, that he had £1.4 million to save because of the real terms reduction delivered by the Scottish Government, and 50% of that would come in staffing. And I just wondered if the Scottish Government were aware of looking at that figure, roughly oh, how many staff uh, they would expect the Crown Office to reduce by to meet that saving that's been inflicted upon them. That will be a matter which will be determined by the Lord Advocate. I think it would be wrong for... I think it would be wrong for... Hold on a minute. I think it would be wrong for... I think it would be wrong for... respond. Yeah, I think it would be wrong for me to start determining what the staffing level should be within the Crown Office, given that the Crown Office is an organisation that's run by the Lord Advocate. And to start setting arbitrary levels that should be the number of staff that he should expect to uh, reduce his staffing complement by. Yeah, and, I think, I, and I think it'd be, I think it's unfair to expect the Lord Advocate to be put in that position. Mm -hmm. That's why that wasn't my question, so I'd, I'd appreciate if you answered my question, which was in terms of predictions, because we've now heard that there is this level of funding that's been cut in real terms by the Scottish Government to the Crown Office. The Crown okay. Office have said we will have to make savings of X amount. 50% of that will come from staffing. And I would have thought well, as Cabinet... Well, if I can just finish my question. I would have thought as Cabinet Secretary for Justice, I'd want to have an idea how many staff that will see reduced in a service which we are hearing from multiple witnesses across the sector that is already under resource because well, when those figures come back from the Lord Advocate when he says to Parliament when he says to you I'm going to reduce it by X <coughs> you might think actually why is a is a more effective number well what, what the Lord Advocate has in the budget he's negotiated with the uh, finance secretary is a budget which in cash terms is the same as he has in this financial year both in terms of revenue and in capital. And in evidence that you heard from the Lord Advocate, he said that was very much in line with what they were anticipating and what they were planning for. I am not going to start getting into uh, levels of saying I expect them to reduce their staffing complement by X 
And the reason I won't do that is because the Crown Office is the responsibility of the Lord Advocate. It would be wrong for me to start setting expectations and what the staffing level should be within the Crown Office when that's a matter which is determined by the Lord Advocate. And I'm going to respect that because I think it would be inappropriate for me to then start to set arbitrary levels which the Lord Advocate then feels he is in some way under pressure in which to deliver. It's a matter for the Lord Advocate to determine that. Will you have concerns if the Lord Advocate or the Crown Agent can't um, uh, fulfil the other 50% in non-staff savings? It would well, be a matter for the Lord Advocate to determine how he so you best be takes that forward. About that. And, I, I, and I, I'm confident from the evidence that you've received from the Lord Advocate in the budget scrutiny process that he believes he has got a budget which will allow him to deliver the prosecution services which the people of Scotland deserve. But he's got a £1.4 million savings, 50% from staff, 50% from non-staff costs. And we heard in the evidence session that the non-staff, um, uh, there's no time scale for it because the Crown <coughs> agent's still waiting for an analysis well, the, of the, 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 the... Sorry, I hadn't even asked a question there, so I wasn't sure what you were going to answer. But the fact that there's no time scale and there's been no analysis done of the options, is that not a concern for you as Cabinet Secretary for Justice that 50% of the saving is coming from an area where we still don't have analysis or options, and therefore, would that not be a concern if they can't make that 50% saving, further savings will come from staff reductions? It would be a concern if I thought that the Crown Office weren't able to manage the budget or the Lord Advocate wasn't able to take that forward. I'm confident the Lord Advocate is. Will you guarantee any time the Lord Advocate comes to you in this next financial year seeking additional resources that that will be granted? Uh, the Lord Advocate, if his budget is negotiated directly with the Finance Secretary, it doesn't come from the Justice Budget. Yeah, but he did say if he's faced with a specific demand, a specific need that requires more funding, he will ask for it. Will that be given by the Scottish Government? Well, that would be a matter which you would have to take up with the Finance Secretary. But just but to give you by, if, well, if you'll let me finish, if you don't mind. Uh, if you uh, look at the actions that we've taken, so for example, some of the additional demand that's been on our justice system in relation to um, uh, sexual and domestic violence cases is that we provided an extra £2.4 million over each of the last two financial years and into the third financial year uh, going forward in order to help to meet some of the pressures which uh, the courts or fiscals uh, have faced as a result of increasing demand within that particular area. So we'll always uh, look to provide support where we can. But if the uh, Lord Advocate is uh, uh, looking to increase his budget within the Crown Office overall, that's a matter which is directly negotiated and constitutionally is the case, is directly negotiated uh, with the, uh, between the Lord Advocate and the Finance Secretary. Again, that wasn't my question, as I think you probably know. I'm not speaking about the negotiation in the Crown Office budget. I'm speaking about additional funding required in year. And that's what the Lord Advocate said during his evidence session, that if he requires it, he will ask for it. You are a member of the Scottish Government. Will the Scottish Government meet any demands from the Lord Advocate for additional funding in this financial year? I'm sure that will be considered in due course. Considered. Well, that's what would happen. Okay. So, can so I you, then you, 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 you are, you are uh, uh, it would be rather naive to think that we'd be in a situation that no matter what is asked for, that I, as a member of the government, would sit here and say, yes, that will be agreed to. Uh, it would be considered at a time when it's received. And I think it would be rather, uh, be rather foolish to think that a member of government was going to give you that commitment here and then not knowing what the request would be. I think it's rather naive or foolish to suggest that the Lord Advocate, someone who we all uh, respect very highly, would come to the government with a request for additional funding that wasn't fully thought through and absolutely required. And would be considered then. Yeah. Okay. Can I ask, are you concerned about the number of adjournments in solemn and summary trials due to a lack of court time? I think um, uh, the, the issue, you received the evidence, I think, in your inquiry from Eric McQueen, the, the Chief Executive of the Scottish Court, uh, and tribunal service, where he uh, set out that the number of trials which we now have in Scottish courts has increased overall. Uh, the percentage of cases where there is inadequate time for them has broadly remained much the same. So, effectively, the courts are operating more efficiently. The number of cases have increased uh, that are going to trial, uh, and the number where there is a, a lack of court time has broadly remained consistent over the last couple of years. 
So the number of solemn trials uh, adjournments due to the lack of court time have increased by 47 per cent since 2011, and summary tri trials have seen a 69 per cent increase in delays over the same period. But the number of trials Sorry, has increased? That, that's fine. That's maybe the question you want to answer, but the question I'm asking, do you think that percentage increase in the adjournments due to a lack of court time has anything to do with your government's decision to close courts? No, it's not. Nothing at uh, all? No, it's not. Uh, and the evidence you received from the Scottish Court Service confirmed that was the case the as well. The evidence we received from However, the Scottish Criminal Bar Association suggested that the lack of courts well, is resulting in more and more trials being adjourned due to a lack no, of court The time. 10 courts, as you heard in your evidence from the Scottish Court Service, the 10 courts which have received additional work as a result of the court closure programme have all increased their efficiency in dealing with court cases. What you're not recognising is that the number of court cases going to trial has increased overall. The percentage where there hasn't been court time for them has broadly remained the same. That means the courts are operating more efficiently because they're dealing with a greater number of trials. Yeah. What, what you're not recognising is you're taking one witness uh, submission, which is perfectly acceptable. I will take another. For example, uh, the defence solicitors who came from Aberdeen, uh, Edinburgh uh, and Glasgow, who said that the courts being closed in many of these areas has resulted in a backlog of cases and more adjournments. Well, I don't believe so the evidence... You don't accept that? I don't accept that. I don't believe the evidence which has been provided to the committee by the Scottish Court and Tribunal but Service... what about the other people? Actually, who provided evidence to the well, committee. Well, respond, you've got, keep in mind that the Scottish Court and Tribunal Service are responsible for the management of these services and the data which they can provide demonstrates that that's not the case. Uh, so the number of cases which the courts are dealing with have increased. The proportion where there's no court time has broadly remained the same. Uh, the number of cases which have been dealt with within the time frame which the court service actually ha has set has actually been maintained and improved. Uh, so the facts that have been provided by the Scottish Court and Tribunal Service and how they measure the efficiency and the performance of the courts don't hold to the view that you're putting. Well, I'm, I'm disappointed that you're not open to the suggestions from other witnesses to this inquiry and you're only quoting the one that suits your argument. I'm basing, it on, the well evidence, I'm basing it on the hard evidence that's been provided by the Scottish Court and Tribunal Service. I think that's a perfectly reasonable thing to do. But you don't think it's hard evidence coming from defence solicitors across Scotland? No, I understand some of the concerns and issues they may raise, but having said that, the hard evidence, the facts and figures that have been provided by the Scottish Court and Tribunal Service don't hold to that view. You Can the Cabinet Secretary... I mean, any adjournment is, is not really something desirable, and there's, there's almost coming through this morning, I, I'm sure you don't intend it, that, you know, it's just the same as we, we were and there might be a slight improvement. You know, surely we can do better than that. And adjournment is just, just such, um, such pressure on everyone in the court service. They've turned up, they've, um, they've appeared and the court's been adjourned. They've had days off work. I mean, we're, we're talking really about everyone's view of the criminal justice system. And this paints probably the worst possible picture. And while the, the court and tribunal service, who I have to say, always come in with a rather optimistic picture of everything that isn't always um, borne out um, when, when their um, view is tested in, in subsequent years, then while they may say that you know, they're quite happy with things, it's not, just, it's not just the Criminal Bar Association. It's social work, it's, it's police, it's all the users of the courts, even the judiciary themselves, are, um, are talking about this. And some are suggesting that the, the court, court closure programme has had an impact. So in view of that, in, in order to take a balanced kind of approach to this, isn't this something that you should take some cognizance of? Well, I, th I think it's important. I, I, I don't believe that the court closure programme has led to um, a, a greater difficulties within the system, and I, a, a, particularly in relation to a court time. If you look at the number of a, a complaints that are called to trial, in 2013-14, it was 40,137. In 2015-16, it was 52,366. The proportion of cases where uh, it was adjourned due to a lack of court time in 2013-14 was 6.3%. Now, we always want to see that figure being as reduced as much as we can. In 2015-16, that figure was 5.6. So they're dealing with more trials, more cases going to trial, 
but there's actually been a reduction in the number of cases which are adjourned due to a lack of court time. Now, what that indicates is that there's greater efficiency in the way in which the courts are actually dealing with cases. However, do we want to see that figure of 5.6% being reduced yet further? Yes, we would like to see that happening. And some of the stuff that we discussed with Stuart Stevenson's questions is about trying to help to achieve that, to try and help to make sure we've got greater efficiency in the way in which the courts are operating, whether it be using technology, whether it be remodeling parts of the system in order to make a much more eff effective and efficient uh, system. But I think it'd be fair to say on the basis of the hard facts is that you can see that the progress that the court service is making has allowed there to be improvement while at the same time dealing with an increasing number of cases that go to trial. Since you have the figures in front of you, what was the greatest um, cause of, of adjournment? It, the greatest cause of adjournment, you see here, it would be in relation to uh, Crown Office, between, between Crown Office and, combination between Crown Office and Defence. So, any more details than that? I can't, not from these particular tables here, but that would be principally the reasons for that. You see the difficulty, Cabinet Secretary. You're coming today, you're quite relaxed about the, the Lord Advocate um, deciding the, the, the amount of staff. We're expressing to you the evidence we've heard about adjournments, which affects everyone in the criminal justice system and, and reflects very badly on the criminal justice system. And yet we don't know precisely what the Defence Crown Office um, problem is that causes the maximum number of adjournments. Well, I can get you some more information on that, if that would be helpful for the purpose of your uh, inquiry. But I think it's important that we make judgments on these bases. Uh, on, on uh, the basis of clear evidence. Which is what I'm asking uh, you Which for, is important. Second. And when uh, it's been suggested that uh, there is uh, less cases, it's, uh, the system's getting worse, actually the hard facts actually demonstrate they're dealing with more trials and actually the number of adjournments due to a lack of court time uh, is actually reducing. Uh, so it's important that the information which members in this committee are basing their judgments on are based on that hard information that we have from the Scottish Court and Tribunal Service on how they're dealing with these matters. Absolutely, but that's why it would have been good today to you, for you to have this information about what caused the, the maximum number of journalists, the detail of that, because it's fundamental to, to this whole inquiry. The, the, the biggest overall factor will be around uh, witnesses not being present or available for cases could, going to trial. Could we have a breakdown? So, so what I can do is, I've, I've said to you, is I can get the Scottish Court and Tribunal Service to provide you with a greater detailed breakdown of this information, that if that would assist helpful. you in your inquiry. Yeah. But I do hope that you will take the basis of information which they have provided as being an accurate reflection of the data and how our court service is managing these matters, because it's based on hard information and how the courts are operating on a daily basis. That's not to say that there are not areas where improvements can be made. That's not to say some of the concerns which are raised by bar associations don't have a legitimacy to them. But to try and portray it as being some sort of deterioration in the situation is factually inaccurate. I, I think we, the, the data that you, you, the extra data and an explanation, a detailed breakdown of that would be very, very useful. And I, I hope you too, Cabinet Secretary, will, will reflect on it. I'm conscious others want to get in, so I'm going to move on. Uh, is a, now, Stuart, was yours a supplementary? And I'll take in Oliver as a supplementary too. Yes. You can't have point of orders in committee, well, but I'll take sorry, your point anyway. I know Stuart anyway. had one earlier then. <laughs> could, could I just check uh, no, at could, an could earlier you, did Yes, I, I know, I've, but you had I've one said committee. you don't have point of orders, okay. but I'll... Uh, what's your, you, well, your it's, it's just to make sure the Cabinet Secretary has given the correct evidence when he is presenting that. You said, and I wrote it down, the number of adjournments have reduced. You quoted percentage figures and I just want to be sure that when you said the number of adjournments had reduced that was correct evidence given. That is a, the 5.6% is a proportion of the 52366 figure. So what's the, the numbers of those two percentages? Well the, the, it will be the, the figure for it will be 5.6% of 52,000 
366. And according to your evidence, that's less than the 6.3% of however many? 40,000. So, so what is the figures? So the figure there is, is a, it, there is more cases going to trial uh -huh. and the number where there is a reduction, where there's a lack of court time has actually proportionally is lower. Yeah, but the actual numbers, that's what you said, the number of adjournments has reduced. So the overall, the actual figure in yeah. terms of the proportion, the figure is higher in terms of hard cases. So it's 26,781. Sorry, yeah. yep. two, uh, sorry, two, sorry, 2,000. Is it this figure here? Yeah, it was 2,873. And it is 3,218. Proportionately, it is a smaller percentage of cases going to trial. But the, sorry, I was asking about the number of adjournments. Yes, due to a so, lack of court time. So that's it. 3218 is the number of adjournments. It is, yes. As compared to 2873. Yes. So that's an increase in the number of adjournments. Yes, but yes. proportionately could, could a smaller... Say, no, no, but I think just for clarity, you did say... We, we, we've yeah. got that. We've got yeah. So your evidence yeah. is now correct. I but think that's important. Proportionally, it's a smaller percentage because of the number of cases that are going to trial, yeah. which but, have increased. But the numbers... So right. As long as you've got the accurate But the number have gone up. Yeah. Stuart Stevenson, supplementary. Oliver Mundell, supplementary. Uh, just in highlighting the sources of adjournments, uh, you identified the defence uh, as being one of the joint leaders in that. I just wonder uh, what work there is under being undertaken with uh, defence agents and their organisations to try and improve the performance of defence in their contribution. Clearly not the responsibility of the Cabinet Secretary, uh, or indeed for that matter the Lord Advocate, but I just wonder what assistance and uh, work there is to reduce them getting down the league of uh, sources of adjournments. So uh, part of this leads into again the procedure and evidence review which, um, uh, which has been taken forward as looking at how we can get greater efficiency and some of the work that's been taken forward as part of that is work which is joint with uh, for example the Law Society uh, for Scotland on looking at how we can actually get greater efficiency within uh, the court process so that we can make sure that there's the, between the Crown sharing of information as early as possible uh, to allow them for preparation of cases, the uh, modelling of the court process and taking it through uh, as well. All of those aspects about trying to make sure that we help to improve efficiency right through the system. Because back to the point I was making right at the very start, that's important we actually look at it as a whole system approach. Uh, the mistake you can make is thinking that if you deal with one part of the justice system, that will just automatically improve things overall. You have to deal with it on a systemic basis. Uh, and uh, some of the work which has been taken forward by the Justice Board and the subgroups uh, is looking specifically at these measures, and that includes looking at how we can help to support defence agents in their preparation in these matters. Thank you. Okay. Oliver Mundell, supplementary. Mm -hmm. Can I just ask why you think the number of cases has gone up? Uh, well, as I mentioned, proportionately, uh, for cases that are going to trial, it has reduced uh, overall. So I mean, overall, if you look at... I meant overall, why do you think the number of cases going through uh, the well, system Part of up? it, there's a variety of different reasons. Part of it is around uh, availability of witnesses. Some of it will be around preparation of cases as well. There are a variety of factors in that. But well, overall, well, uh -huh. overall well, given the number of cases which are going to trial, is that proportionately that a greater number of them are actually going forward on the basis that the, there has been a, a, a drop in the, I would you call it, drop in overall proportionate level that there's no court time for. I'm just asking, so in, in, I'm just asking why more cases in general are going to trial, and you're saying that's because there's now more court time? No, in terms of going to trial, there's a, a, an example would be, for example, around uh, the increasing number of cases around domestic and sexual violence. So um, uh, given the very nature of them, more of them end up going to trial. So, for example, if you look at the change in investigative procedure which the police now have around domestic violence, uh, some of the cases, it's no longer a single... Uh, uh, it's not longer a single case, it's multiple cases that are coming forward, which are more complex, take up more time in court as a result, uh, and uh, in some cases there are multiple uh, 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 victims. So... Uh, by the very nature, these are cases where they're less likely to be an early plea entered and they're more complex uh, and more challenging cases, which means there are more going to trial as a result. Yep. No, I, I welcome that uh, fact. But you would you'd accept <coughs> that that's a policy decision that's resulted in an increased number of cases? 
Um, I think it's an example of the increasing complexity of these cases, yes. For example, changes in investigative technique. Uh, uh, so the way in which, uh, uh, the, for example, the, the Crown Office have their... Uh, uh, they've got um, uh, staff at a national level uh, in dealing with sexual and domestic violence cases as well. Uh, the police have obviously got their own specialist staff now in these areas. Uh, I think it's a reflection changes in approach uh, uh, in these areas, which alongside the fact that it's now a, a greater priority for us as a society, it has driven some of the demand in the system and the complex nature of these cases. And do you think that demand could have been better anticipated in order to avoid some of the figures that you talked about before? Because I accept that in percentage terms it's less. But, Good. But when you look at the, 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 the witnesses that are coming to this committee, those, those percentages and the increased number, in, you know, the actual, increase in the actual number, you know, are giving a perception to people involved at all levels of the criminal justice system, different stakeholders, you know, that things aren't working as, officially, as efficiently as they could. And if that number continues to increase in uh, real terms, it does undermine justice, does it not? Uh, no, I think that's a reasonable point to make. In that, um, it, it, when you do see changes like this, that it, it can drive, uh, it, you know, unintended consequences within the system at times. I'm sure you'll appreciate it's difficult to anticipate uh, the numbers of cases which will come forward. So, for example, the number of cases which have come forward around historical sex abuse uh, in itself has been very difficult to anticipate. A large part of that has been driven by some of the major issues uh, that have come to the fore in, uh, through the Savile case, etc., which have driven more complaints in the system. So there's an element where it, it can be difficult to anticipate that. To try and assist with that... Um, as I made the point to uh, your colleague, Mr Ross, earlier on, to try and assist with some of that, what we have in years provided additional resource to different parts of the justice system to try to help to support meet some of that demand. Uh, and uh, uh, we've done that over the last two years and into the next uh, financial year as well in helping to support both the Crown Office uh, and our courts. Uh, so it's about court time and also uh, judicial time as well uh, to deal with some of the increase in demand coming from domestic violence and uh, sexual violence cases. So, uh, and as the evidence that you've received from Audit Scotland has highlighted, that's allowed us to have greater efficiency in dealing with these cases. So particularly around domestic violence and meeting the, uh, the time frame for dealing with these uh, cases. So uh, it is difficult to anticipate it, but where, where we can, we will try to do that and work with other parts of the justice uh, agencies to, to try and achieve that. But equally, um, uh, we need to make sure that uh, we remain alive to that uh, in the course of any given year. And we have responded to that over the last couple of years, particularly given the demand around domestic and sexual violence cases. Because I think that's... Uh, my, my own personal uh, concern is really that the Crown Office is still going through this period of, of transformational change. Uh, it seems to be constant, uh, you know, changes in, in guidance and policy, you know, reorganisations, doing things differently. You know, I, I, do th I, I do think that makes it, you know, it does make some of these things, you know, very challenging for, for staff on, on the ground, people who are on the coalface, you know, dealing with these cases on a day-to-day -day basis. And they are being stretched and pulled in, in, in different directions. I think we've just got to be careful, uh, that, you know, that some of some of the teething issues, you know, around what, what are intended improvements, you know, where cases are being adjourned, you know, for, for every single person who's involved in that case, they do leave, uh, you know, proceedings with a sort of negative impression of how justice is done in Scotland. And I think that, you know, it needs to be looked at a little bit more closely. Well, look, I, I've, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm confident that the Lord Advocate will be keen to make sure that uh, the, the Crown Office and the Fiscal Service operate as efficiently as effectively as possible and that uh, they, they try to support staff as best they can as uh, well. And no doubt, when he gives evidence to you, he'll be able to explain how they will uh, seek to address some of these issues. But I, I don't underestimate the challenges that there are for fiscals in meeting some of the demands in the day-to-day -day job that they have to do but also uh, 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 being part of an organisation that's changing. Um, that brings challenges in it in itself. So, um, uh, you know, I don't underestimate that. And I think it's important that, uh, as a service, they are alive to these issues and that they try to address them as best they can. But, you know, that, that is a matter for the Lord Advocate, who's responsible for the Crown Office and the operation of the Crown Office and for the uh, way in which they deal with the staff within the organisation. Yeah, but by and large, I think we are very well served by our uh, Crown Office and our Procurator Fiscal Service here in Scotland. 
Um, uh, we've got uh, some outstanding uh, members of staff. We can see that from the cases that end up going to court and uh, the way in which they uh, deal with them. But there will always be areas where it can be improved. There will always be challenges. There will always be pressures in the system uh, at any given uh, at time. Uh, but by and large, uh, we are still very well served by our prosecution services here in Scotland. And I'm very confident the Lord Advocate will uh, continue that uh, uh, in the year ahead. But you are mindful of those yes. pressures. So Supplementary, yeah. Oliver, yeah, so I think you really okay. covered things well. Yeah. I think the point is that we very much welcome the additional information you're going to, to provide, uh, Cabinet Secretary. There is no question the committee, and we are all fully um, behind the, the staff in the Crown and Procurator Fiscal Service, who we recognise do a magnificent job under real pressure. And I think an analysis of the information you're going to provide will, will help to support them further, so we look forward to hearing it. Waiting very patiently, Ben, then Liam. Thank you very much, Convener. I just wanted to return to one of the, the core themes of the, the inquiry around uh, victims and witnesses, and re really welcome the, the statements earlier about the, ho the whole system approach and uh, vic support victim services around that. Uh, at the end of last year, when we, we had the Lord, the Lord Advocate uh, here giving evidence, um, he w warmly welcomed that the, the, the justice portfolio will include a significant increase for voluntary organisations working in the criminal justice system uh, in the sector to support victims and witnesses um, from 4.5 million to 15.8. And I just wanted to, to ask uh, Cabinet Secretary whether you could elaborate on where the additional funding for, for voluntary organisations will be targeted, or is that uh, still being processed? Um, there are some parts of it which are still to be uh, determined. This uh, is in part linked to the additional £20 million which the First Minister gave a commitment to uh, in helping to improve the way in which we deliver services for uh, uh, victims of uh, domestic uh, violence uh, and to uh, assist us in eradicating uh, violence against uh, girls and uh, women of that uh, uh, £15.8 million, pounds, a significant portion of that is around helping to support those services and the way in which we uh, can uh, help to address that issue much more effectively. So that will go from, it will also include elements uh, beyond that, the uh, uh, £2.4 million pounds which we provide to help to support the efficiency of our uh, fiscal service and the court service in dealing with these cases as well, uh, through to uh, a portion of that funding then going to uh, third sector organisations to help them in the support they provide to uh, both victims and witnesses. So for example, one of the things we've been able to do as a result of that additional funding over the last year or so is to be able to extend the uh, range of services that Rape Crisis Scotland can provide. So, for example, in Mr MacArthur's constituency, for the first time, we're able to actually provide the right type of support to women uh, who may uh, 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 suffer uh, sexual violence uh, in the islands, which previously was not available because there was no dedicated service there. Uh, so it allows us to provide greater national reach in some of these services in a way that wasn't there uh, previously. So that's uh, so it'll be uh, those types of approaches which will continue to take forward. So um, uh, a significant portion of it is for the uh, uh, domestic and sexual violence areas, helping to improve the management of these cases through the justice system as well, and then supporting third sector organisations in the services that they provide to uh, victims and witnesses in these areas. Thank you. And, and through the justice system, one of the, the themes that's really come through through uh, the evidence that we've taken has been uh, both uh, before the uh, trial process, during the trial process and, and indeed afterwards how important victim support is. And while the Crown agent confirmed to, to me when, when he, he was here before Christmas that the, this increase will not directly increase VIA's funding, I just wondered at this stage if you envisage how uh, the VIA service will, will benefit from the increased funding uh, to the, the third sector organisations. Well, um, obviously, if we are providing additional support to some of the third sector organisations that are working with uh, uh, victims of crimes as well, is that that will be additional support which will be provided directly to them, uh, 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 over and above anything that's provided by the VIA system. Uh, so uh, uh, that will provide additional capacity in the system overall. Although it won't be additional resource for uh, VIA, it will be additional resource which will be provided to organisations that are working with uh, victims of crime. So it will uh, provide us with additional capacity um, across the system, um, uh, which will be of a support uh, to the direct support that's also provided by the Crown Office through the VIA programme. Thank you. I mean, I think that's 
will be welcomed by the whole com committee because uh, the support for victims has been such a key theme that's come through throughout our inquiry. So thank you for expanding on that. Right, Mary Fee. Um, thank you. Good morning. Um, oh, oh so my apologies, Mary. Supplementary. Yeah, uh -huh. thank you. I, I just want my original question was the, the, the question that, um, that, that, that Ben had asked, but I just wanted to ask um, Cabinet Secretary for a bit more information about the, the victim um, information and advice service, because one of the things that we heard when we took evidence from um, witnesses throughout the inquiry um, was that once they engaged with the service, the service could be very good but they had to actually be the people that did the engaging. The service wasn't proactive enough in, in some cases. And while I appreciate that it's the Crown Office that operates that service, mm. will you give a commitment to work with them to ensure that the service does try to become more proactive in how, how it operates and deals with, with victims? Well, I, I'm, I'm more than happy to work with any uh, you know, aspect within the service that we can help to support and improving. Um, It'll obviously be for the Lord Advocate to yes. explain how, uh, how, how he intends to take that forward within the Crown Office. I think uh, what uh, additional support we can provide is uh, particularly in supporting those other organisations that work with both uh, 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 victims and witnesses and supporting them uh, with the court system directly in itself. Um, I think part of the challenge can often be in the system is uh, uh, individuals being aware of what is available to them. So one of the things that we brought in through the victims and witnesses legislation was the requirement for services to publish the data and the information about uh, what uh, uh, what services were providing to uh, victims and uh, witnesses. So, um, yeah, I think uh, uh, we can, uh, if there's, as I say, it'd be for the Lord Advocate to determine how he chooses to change anything within the Crown Office on that. But I'm certainly keen, and that's uh, what I can give you an assurance of, is to make sure that the wider work we are doing around victims and witnesses, that it tries to dovetail as best possible with the way in which they're delivering those types of support services through the Crown Office. Okay, that's fine. Thank you. Certainly there was compelling evidence um, when we heard from witnesses, um, sometimes the very traumatic victims, others, that the experience with victim support and, and fear was was not what they expected. They weren't informed in time. They weren't told of an adjournment. Mm. And, and I think the most worrying thing of all, um, at least two of them said, had they known what would happen in their experience through an, the, the, the trial, um, they wouldn't do it again, basically. Yeah. And that must be a measure that concerns us all. Uh, uh, very much so. I think we, we, it goes back to the point I was making earlier on about the need to, uh, although there have been significant improvements, there's still a lot more to do uh, to improve for both uh, uh, victims and uh, witnesses. And uh, I think it's, uh, I'm very conscious that there are still systemic challenges within our justice system, particularly for uh, accused around how uh, some of the justice system presently operates. Um, and a, a very good example will be of that, in my view, is around uh, 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 child victims, uh, about the need, although there are certain supports which are there at the present time, there are certain protective measures around uh, being able to give evidence through CCTV, uh, but the ability to actually be able to uh, 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 create a system that allows uh, for um, uh, for uh, evidence to be uh, taken prior to the trial um, is a much better system, in my view, in helping to actually uh, meet some of these challenges for uh, child witnesses. So there are still areas where we need to make significant change and improvement for uh, uh, victims. I'm determined to do what we can to help to uh, uh, achieve that while at the same time making sure the balances, checks and balances we have within our justice system are appropriately protected uh, and managed as well. So um, I, you know, I, I fully accept there is more to do, although significant progress has been made. Well, I think you'll find the, the letter that we'll send you on the Moira Fund very um, illuminating, and especially uh, the, the comments about the victims of homicide you know, the uh, families of the victims and the support they receive. Um, now, Fulton, I'm, I'm in a dilemma because poor Liam's been waiting for it forever. Could we leave your question to... Oh, yes, I should, if you don't mind, if the committee don't mind coming back to it. Are you okay with that, Liam? 
It's very yeah. small. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Carry on. Uh, I did have a uh, thanks very much and thanks, uh, Cabinet Secretary. I did have a line of question on this, but um, both Ben and um, Mary have, have covered it um, quite well, probably coming from a kind of similar um, standpoint. But I just wonder what your view, uh, Cabinet Secretary, is on victims becoming involved once, because I, I can see the complications before an accused is found guilty, but once somebody's found guilty, what would be your view on victims if they so wished to be involved in? Um, the sort of sentencing uh, options that are available. Um, not, not, not to decide a sentencing option, but perhaps at, uh, in my previous job, I worked in criminal justice social work, perhaps to be involved in maybe the report evidence gathering stage, uh, like, like they used to be. I think that's something that's went by the wayside. I just wondered if you had a view on that. There is obviously the, the victim impact statement uh, provision, which we have uh, uh, at the present moment. Um, if there are issues around how that's operating, uh, be you know, be content for that to be looked at to see there's ways in which we could actually improve the manner in which it's operating, uh, and if there's evidence to suggest there are problems with it, uh, you know, if there are if there are victims' organisations that have got views about how the role of victims can be better uh, met within our justice system, I'm always open to considering those. So, um, uh, you know, I. Uh, you know, the reassurance I can give the member is that if there are ways in which we can improve it, then I'm open to exploring them. Um, I don't have a fixed view on what the best option actually is, and part of that should be informed by the experience of uh, victims. So, uh, uh, but I, uh, I think if there are, uh, if there's any evidence of some of the provisions which we have at the present moment not operating as efficiently or as effectively as they could be. Then, uh, do you call it, then I'm more than happy to look at trying to address those issues. That's good. Liam. Thank you very much, uh, convener. Um, I'm going to take you on to the issue of case marking. I mean, obviously, the, the rationale behind it is not solely about cost reduction and, and greater efficiency, although it, that's certainly been um, sort of cited in, in defence of the, the move towards a, a central system of marking. We've heard from a range of, of uh, witnesses, uh, concerns will come on to some of that evidence in, this, in, in a moment, but generally I think the, the, the feeling that there's a loss of um, local discretion and, and that as a result one of the consequences of that are that cases are being marked for, for prosecution that wouldn't otherwise uh, have, have gone to court. And I, I think uh, obviously that somewhat undermines the argument for making the, uh, the system more efficient. Well, I'm conscious you've had a, a mixture of evidence uh, in this issue that you would evidence from the uh, uh, Fiscals Association in challenging some of the assertions that they were putting forward cases where they didn't believe there was a sufficiency of evidence to uh, support a prosecution. And uh, they've challenged that on the basis that they uh, it wouldn't do so um, uh, as well. I think it, the important principles here are that if there is a if there is a, a crime has been committed and there's a sufficiency of evidence for a prosecution, then that case should be uh, considered for prosecution. Uh, and uh, it should then be looked uh, uh, been taken forward on that basis. It's, I think that was more in relation to the, the guidance around domestic violence that, that, that those questions were arising. I think the issue that, that I'm driving at in terms of central marking is there's a lack of awareness at a central level about the variety of options that would be open um, to taking forward that, that, that case and, uh, and identifying a, a, an appropriate solution in each and every instance. Mm. Um, and that that is a, a, is a result of the loss of the local knowledge of the circumstances that arise in any particular case. Well, look, if there was a, if there's an issue about guidance that's been issued to fiscals in, uh, in uh, marking of cases, that is very much a matter for the Lord Advocate to determine and how that can best be achieved. It's, uh, clear an area within his responsibilities and um, it would be wrong for me to start suggesting how that should be addressed but I, um, I think it's important that, um, that, that there, is a, uh, there is a level of uh, flexibility in the system but there's also a level of consistency in it as well uh, so no matter where you are a victim of a crime in Scotland that, that it's going to be dealt with in a consistent fashion but uh, uh, the, uh, so I think it's um, when you've got a national prosecution service, then it, it's difficult to imagine anything other than a national policy approach to how they take forward uh, cases. But 
in terms of the guidance which is issued to fiscals, that is very much a matter for the Lord Advocate. I, in a sense, under the previous system, they had marking guidelines, so there was a consistency. But I think what has been expressed is a concern that in moving to a central system, there's a lack of awareness of the circumstances mm. that may arise in a particular case, either through a knowledge of the individuals concerned, um, uh, possibly through uh, a better understanding of the, the measures that could be, um, could be used uh, in order to uh, secure justice in a particular uh, in a particular area. I mean, if I, if I quote from the Bar Association, um, they suggest the central marking of cases results in all of Scotland being dealt with as if they are Glasgow and Edinburgh and the other cities, despite this not being uh, reflective of the communities that require to be served and the issues in those local areas uh, that are relevant uh, and arise. Um, and they go on to say the removal of the, uh, from the local uh, procurator fiscal uh, of the right and responsibility to make decisions about the marking of cases uh, in his, his or her ju jurisdiction has led to decisions being made that are at, uh, at odds with the issues in the community that, that matter to the, the, the local community. That amounts to a denial of local justice and accountability. Now, I, I take your point about consistency. Uh, I think the argument that's being made is that with marking guidelines, it's perfectly um, possible to achieve a level of, of uh, consistency uh, while still taking into a, a account local circumstances, whether that, as I say, is an, a, a, an understanding of the individuals uh, involved, but also an understanding of, of, of the, uh, the measures that are available locally, which will be different in my constituency from, uh, from, uh, from your own uh, mm. constituency. But in terms of achieving an outcome uh, in, in, uh, uh, in the interests of victims, but also the local, local communities themselves, public interest um, may be more appropriately d delivered by a more localised or a return to a more localised marking of cases. It sounds like well, you're looking for consistent flexibility um, in the approach here in some ways. I think uh, uh, any change in approach around that matter is very much a matter for the Lord Advocate uh, in determining how that's taken forward. Uh, but and, the policy uh, decision around this that's not something the Scottish Government has an interest in, is that what you're saying? But, it, but, it's, but it's a matter for the Lord Advocate in deciding what guidance and the approach he takes within the fiscal, within the organisation. Um, it, it's not for me to, uh, uh, to set out how I believe that should best be achieved. That's very much a matter for the Lord Advocate. Um, uh, but I understand the concerns and the issues which are, have been raised and the points that uh, you're making. Um, uh, how the Crown Office should respond to those matters is very much a matter for the, the Crown Office and the Lord Advocate. But if I can touch on, on, on one of the other concerns, as I say, there have been, there have been a, a variety of concerns from a variety of witnesses uh, around this, that the, the, the Law Society of Scotland, again, touching on many of the, the, the points made by the, the Bar Association, um, uh, raises the concern in relation to custody cases that uh, on occasion prosecutor fiscal deputies uh, in a local court do not know when custody papers will be available because they're not in control of them. Uh, there then can be a, a delay in custody papers being made available to, to the court and accordingly a delay in custody cases being able to progress through the court. So I think back to the points we were discussing earlier on about moving in a direction that is, is, is more um, efficient, that reduces delay, etc., and, and the costs involved in that. We appear to be in a situation here where the Law Society of Scotland are firmly of the view um, that that change to a more centralised marking uh, of, of, uh, of custody cases uh, is, is going against the grain of, of, of what you and the Lord Advocate are seeking to achieve. Well, a, a key part uh, in determining the approach, though, within the <coughs> organisation, should the member respect, is a matter for the Lord Advocate. That's his, that's his policy responsibility, and it is within his uh, independent role in determining uh, uh, prosecution policy and how they manage these matters. But it, this, this is a, but it's a, it's a good illustration, I think, though, where uh, it, we need to make sure we're taking a whole system approach in recognising that if you take a particular policy position in one part of the system, it has an impact on the rest of, uh, it can have an impact on the rest of the justice system. Um, and that's where the uh, Justice Board uh, provides a role in helping to try and plan and manage these things. So uh, by and large, the Crown Agent would normally be part in the, uh, in the Justice Board. We'd be involved in the discussions, looking at if they're taking forward a particular approach and looking at what the impact might be on the police, how it then uh, can consider how it may have an impact on the courts uh, and how that can be looked at throughout the whole of the system. Uh, and there are some aspects of that can also look at defence agents, uh, for example, uh, through uh, the Law Society 
uh, in some of the bar associations. So, um, I was going to say the uh, Justice Board, though, I mean, the one that can so the Justice Board, because so the bar associations aren't um, No, they're aren't not on that, that. no, uh, uh, as well. But what, what they can is they have, uh, some of them have, uh, the Justice Board has some sub uh, committees and some of those will actually engage directly with stakeholders to explore particular matters uh, to then work up some details and then they'll bring these matters to the Justice Board in itself. So there's a, uh, uh, but the Justice Board provides a very, I believe, a very effective uh, model uh, and system which can support uh, that type of whole system approach. Uh, as I say, we're talking here about uh, largely the criminal justice system. It's got the uh, chief executive of the, uh, the Children's uh, 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 Reporter Service on it, a range of us ourselves, uh, but it allows senior figures from a whole range of the justice organisations to come together to look at these types of issues and then for some groups to be set up but looking at some of the specific measures that need to be taken to try and address those and that includes engaging with other stakeholders mm. and trying to find the most appropriate means in which to do that. I mean, I hear what you're saying about the, the, the responsibility of the Lord Advocate and the role the Justice Board um, uh, would, uh, would take in this and I, I, I don't doubt that, but given the extent of the, the concerns that we've heard through this evidence session about the way that this central marking system is working, uh, perhaps adopting the approach that, that Mary Fee um, took earlier on, could I invite you to, to, to work with the Lord Advocate uh, and those on the Justice Boards to see how this whole system um, uh, approach is working? Because clearly the evidence we are getting is that we've moved away from a system, a system that had real benefits in, in, in terms of understanding um, the, uh, the, the, the measures that are available um, at a local level and ensuring that actually in terms of the execution of justice uh, that we have um, the consistency that um, I think rightly we want to see, but actually the flexibility that, that, that is, uh, I think, necessary, um, given that not all um, projects and, and, and services will be available or, or alternatives mm. to court prosecution. Um, are available in, in all parts of the country in the same way. Mm. Well, I can give I can give the member uh, an assurance that you know through the the, the, the justice board setup we've got is a, it's an opportunity for some of these issues to be considered and to be discussed uh, and to be looked at. And I've got no doubt that uh, when you take evidence from the Lord Advocate, we'll be able to explain the approach they're uh, intending to take and how they uh, may seek to address some of these concerns. And uh, that again can be part of some of the work which the Justice Board uh, uh, does. But I'm, you know, I'm uh, uh, very clear, and um, I'm sure you'll hear from the Lord Advocate as well, is a recognition about that whole system approach, about making sure that we try to uh, 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 link up uh, the complex parts of our justice system uh, as effectively as possible and that the policy decisions that we take in one area that we recognise the impact they can have on our parts of the justice system when we try to plan uh, to manage these things effectively. So uh, I'm happy to give the member an assurance that, you know, that um, we'll continue to take an approach that helps us to try and take that whole system approach, uh, including the impact that uh, policy decisions within the Crown Office have in other parts of the justice system. Just on the Justice Board's um, Cabinet Secretary, I understand Defence aren't represented on them at all, and yet they, they have a wealth of knowledge about what goes on in the, the courts and the criminal justice system. Would it be an idea or a suggestion that perhaps they could be invited to, to participate? Yeah, I'm not entirely sure if that would be the right thing to do, because um, uh, it, it's the, it's the uh, senior figures from a range of justice-based organisations uh, delivery agencies uh, that come together. Um, I think it would be fair to say that they do engage uh, with a whole range of stakeholders within the justice system, um, but these are the senior individuals that have got responsibility for delivery of services, so whether it be from the Children's Hearing Service through to the Crown Office, through to our prison service, through to our, uh, through to our, uh, our courts. Um, uh, uh, but there is an opportunity in the work that they do for defence to be engaged in that process. And um, as far as I'm aware, they've been engaged in processes and in, in, in some, looking at some of the issues that have come about as a result of uh, discussions at the, uh, at the Justice Board. But um, I'm not entirely sure whether uh, being a member of it is the right thing, but engaged in the process uh, that they have uh, when it's relevant to them, I think, is, is something that already happens and uh, I would expect to continue to happen.
if that could be looked at, because some of the best and constructive evidence we've had, and it has been constructive uh, and very positive about the Crown and Procurator Fiscal Service and the defence relationship with them, I think there's very valuable discussions to be had about how the system could be improved to everyone's mutual benefit. So uh, I'm encouraged that the, the Cabinet Secretary doesn't entirely perhaps rule that out. No, I, I don't think I don't think it'd be appropriate for them to be a member of it, but I think engaged More in its work, uh, yes. And uh, and those who are members of it, for example, when there are specific subgroups which are set up to look at a particular policy area where defence agents have a clear interest in it as well. Uh, keep in mind, defence of, of have got their own interests, and uh, and these are the leaders of the uh, the justice delivery organisations, and as an element where I. I don't feel it would be appropriate for defence uh, uh, to have a direct membership of it, but engaged in the parts that are relevant to them uh, through the uh, structures that the board has, yes. Uh, but I'm, I'm not persuaded that they should be a member of it, given their own distinct interests. Well, whichever way their, their uh, evidence and constructive evidence, which mm. was given, can be brought uh, into the picture, I think would be helpful. Mary, I'm going to take you next, because you haven't had a question okay. yet. Thank you. It's about the Inspectorate of Prosecution. I mean, through the evidence that we received uh, from quite a wide range of organisations and from different people, I mean, very few people were aware of the Inspectorate, uh, let alone aware of the work that they undertook. And it's really just to hear your thoughts on that and if that concerns you, uh, the general lack of awareness about what the Inspectorate does. Um, well, the... It's, it's a... Given the nature of the role, I can understand that they don't ne necessarily generate a lot of public interest uh, because they are very focused on the uh, Crown, Crown Office and the Procurator uh, Fiscal Service. Um, however, the reports are published, publicly available. Um, uh, it would be really down to the inspector to decide on uh, if they wish to increase their profile, how they would wish to go about doing that. I think it's, it's also worth keeping in mind, though, is that the inspector don't deal with individual complaints. Um, uh, that would go through the Crown Office in the normal process, then going to the Ombudsman. But, uh, uh, you know, if the, if the inspector would have the view that they wanted to increase their profile and their role, then it would be very much a matter for the inspector to decide on how they want to go about doing that. I wouldn't have any objections to it. Um, uh, but I do think they provide a very valuable role um, uh, and they provide a very important role uh, in looking at our uh, justice system uh, and, and the, uh, a part of the justice system in the, uh, the Crown Office. Uh, but, um, uh, you know, if they, if they want to increase their profile, uh, then I wouldn't have any concerns about them seeking to do so. Thank you. I suppose it was just a surprise. I mean, like you say, but the nature of the work that they do, their public profile might, may not be all that high. But I suppose it's from some of the organisations you were hearing from that you would almost expect to have heard of the inspectorate. And I think that was what was quite surprising in, in some of the evidence. Um, so really, I would just ask, I mean, do you think they are effective in their role? And also, on the back of that, we had evidence from the Law Society of Scotland uh, in, in relation to the Inspectorate of Prosecution's effectiveness. And they, in terms of their transparency and their independence, they had suggested that the inspector should bring on board people who uh, are not Procurator Fiscals or who have no connection to the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service. And it was really just to hear your thoughts uh, around that and if you think that would be beneficial. Um, well, I do think they're effective uh, in, in the service uh, deliver. Obviously, it's, it's now been in place for uh, several years, and it actually stems back from the inquiry, which uh, followed, if I recall correctly, it was the, uh, the Chokar case, um, uh, and the way in which the uh, Crown Office had handled that particular uh, 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 matter and the, uh, uh, and the report that was then produced um, uh, uh, following... Uh, uh, Dr. Raj uh, Jando's uh, uh, inquiry into the matter. Uh, so I do think it's effective. Um, uh, using uh, uh, individuals who are uh, not members of the 
uh, the Crown Office or Procurator Fiscal uh, Service. There's always benefit, and it would be for Inspector to explain this uh, more clearly, but it's a bit like the, uh, the uh, HMICS, is that there's always benefit in actually being able to second people in who have got expertise when you're undertaking a particular area of inquiry, who uh, know what this is, how the system operates, have an understanding of the system, uh, there, is, uh, there is value that can be gained from that. That's not to say that bringing someone in from the outside as and when it's appropriate shouldn't be done, and I suspect the inspector will do that as and when uh, the occasion uh, arises. But I, I think it's always trying to trying to get that balance between making sure that you've got uh, uh, the right skill set in those undertaking the inquiry uh, uh, that have uh, uh, the knowledge and skills uh, of the area that you're looking at, while at the same time also making sure it's very clear it's an independent investigation and will uh, report independently uh, uh, as well. But I think by and large to get that, that balance uh, uh, correct. But I suspect the principal reason that they probably draw in people from the fiscal service is because of their expertise in a given area when they're conducting an inquiry. Okay, thank you. Liam? Yeah. Supplementary. Can I start at that point from Mario when she fairly outlined <coughs> the concern that's been raised that in, in a sense the, uh, the, the makeup of the, the inspectorate is drawn so heavily from the uh, uh, Crown Office Procurator Fiscal Service. I mean, I, I take your point about having an understanding of it. I think the, the concern, though, is that you have somebody who's seconded in there who will be going back to the Procurator Fiscal Service mm. and therefore um, doesn't necessarily have um, the perceived independence that somebody who may have experience of the Procurator Fiscal Service and therefore is not going up a learning curve, but isn't due to be going back to the Procurator Fiscal mm. Service um, immediately after they, they finish with the inspector. You don't see that as a as a legitimate concern? I, I can understand the challenges, the, the perception uh, that uh, uh, people can have. There will always be a limited pool of individuals you can draw upon with the right expertise uh, when you're conducting these inquiries, which I suspect will present some of the challenges. If there, if there is a view, um, uh, particularly from the inspector, about how that could, how they could uh, uh, alter the present arrangement in order to try and address any concerns or issues that were being uh, raised, then, uh, uh, then if that required any legislative change, then we'd be open to looking at that. It was a piece of legislation at the time when it was taken forward to cross-party support. It was broadly welcomed within Parliament, it was seen as a positive step. I think it is a positive service. I think it adds value to our justice system. Um, uh, the legislation is also very clear that, um, uh, that the inspector is entirely independent in conducting their role. Uh, uh, and in the issuing of their reports and their findings. Um, so there is protections in there uh, on that. Uh, I suspect though part of the challenge will be is the, the limited pool of expertise uh, in the country that, uh, that the inspector can draw upon for any given particular inquiry uh, uh, without... Uh, 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 and without being able to draw upon some of that expertise within the Crown Office and the Procurator Fiscal Service may make that quite challenging. So um, I understand the perception issue. I think there are safeguards within the legislation. Um, I think trying to change it further it could make it uh, potentially a bit uh, difficult for the inspector to get the right skill sets uh, uh, for inquiries. But if there are ways in which they think that could be achieved, and if it required some form of legislative change from the government to help to support that, then I'd be very open to looking at that and exploring that. Yep, I think that's helpful. Perception is everything, um, Cabinet Secretary. And at the same time, could it be looked at um, the fact that the Lord Advocate appoints the head of the inspectorate, who then reports on the organisation which the Lord Advocate heads? And I think there could be more transparency and perhaps a, a strengthening of the independence if that particular um, issue was looked at. Uh, well, that would require legislative change uh, because the legislation requires a Lord Advocate to make that appointment. Um, uh, however, there is protection within the legislation and they, uh, once they've been appointed in undertaking their role and they do so on an independent basis and publish reports uh, independently. But I, I think... Um, uh, I agree with you, perception's important, uh, but that's also got to be weighed up against reality. Uh, is, there, is there anything to suggest that the way in which the, uh, the inspector's operating at the present moment is not uh, 
is is in some way not effective, or that it is uh, uh, that uh, some of these issues that uh, members have mentioned in some way compromise its uh, role. So you know, I'm always open to looking to see how we can improve things, but um, I'm conscious that perception plays a part. But also, uh, we've also got a question where the reality is: does it is it making much of a difference? Uh, if we say the Lord Advocate didn't appoint the person that was, I don't know, say Parliament appointed the person uh, instead, uh, would that in practice change anything? Um, it, maybe from a perception point of view it would. Uh, but by and large I think the inspector does a, a, a fairly robust and effective job just now in inspecting our prosecution services. Happy that you're open to looking at it. Um, we've now got Douglas Rona and Mary Ann. Can I ask the, the questions and the answers from now on to be quite concise? Okay. Okay. I just wanted to follow up on a couple of earlier issues. We spoke about child and vulnerable witnesses and changes for them. Do you have any plans to change uh, the number of police officers called to give evidence, the amount of time they spend in the court system it sometimes felt wasted because they could be out on the streets and be more mm -hmm. overt rather than waiting to give evidence which could be agreed at an earlier stage um, and also cited and then not used. <clears throat> well, there have been improvements made um, over recent years by the, the, uh, by the, uh, the system which the police now operate, the, the, the witness scheduler, to help to manage some of police time that's involved in uh, having to be uh, witnesses in uh, court cases. So there have been significant improvements. I think there's no doubt that, um, uh, that some of the uh, efficiencies and improvements that could be achieved through uh, the recommendations within the procedure and evidence review uh, could help to reduce the churn in witnesses, uh, which would help to address some of the issues that the police have in uh, the time that they find being taken up as witnesses in uh, court. So uh, I, 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 there is certainly more can be done. And I think some of that will come about more through remodelling of the system uh, to some extent to try and make it uh, more uh, efficient. So um, there have been improvements, but I think there is more that could be done. And, and then finally, can I ask you, you mentioned in your answer to Stuart Stevenson about uh, police um, uh, wearing cameras and then that being used by the Crown Office, by the court system, but there is a problem in terms of technology that they don't all match. Can you understand why that is a frustration in, in 2017? And really, what is the blockage in this day and age to have services that work very closely with each other on a range of different issues not able all the time to view one piece of evidence in three different locations in three different sectors which could result in you know, evidence being clarified at an early stage, pleas being agreed at an early stage because they are all able to watch it on the same devices. It just seems strange that we're sat here still speaking about getting computers to work uh, with images. I think um, it, part of the challenge is uh, trying to make sure that the, uh, the uh, IT infrastructure uh, between the police, the Crown Office, other parts of the justice system is as integrated as possible uh, to be able to share that information. You know, I think if you look at, um, uh, for example, when I, was a, when I was a health minister, there was a big push for us to move much more towards uh, uh, telehealth medicine. And, uh, uh, and for example, in, in the members' own area in Grampian, there was a very good example of uh, some pilots which were tested out in taking uh, telehealth uh, forward. One of the challenges which you identified is that uh, the mistake you can make is that if you don't actually uh, get the right investment right through the system, then you can end up making an investment in one part of the system, but the rest of it's not able to actually get the benefit from it. So uh, the example I was given around uh, body-worn cameras from the police is that the body-worn cameras from the police, it's not just a case of issuing them, it's making sure the police then have an IT system that can actually download that stuff, that it can actually then be transmitted to the Procurator Fiscal and the Crown Office, that they are able to then transmit that to defence agents, that it can then be transmitted to the courts, it can then be displayed in courts. So um, uh, you're right, I share uh, the frustration that many members have, uh, not just in Parliament, but those who work within the justice system about making that type of coordinated approach possible. Uh, that's part of what the digital strategy, the justice digital strategy is about, about trying to make that, take that forward. So one of the things that we are uh, looking to take forward in the course of the next year is the digital vault, 
uh, which will allow, which is a, a shared uh, system between the police and the court service and the Crown Office, uh, to be able to use CCTV footage that can be put into that system and it can be shared and it can be utilised uh, on a shared basis. And we'll hopefully take that forward in the next uh, couple of uh, uh, months over the course of uh, this year. So part of it is about uh, about existing systems which they're already operating, which aren't necessarily compatible, that it would require considerable capital investment across all of the system to uh, create a system that will actually allow it all to be uh, seamlessly linked up. Uh, so it's about trying to manage it uh, in a way that allows us to get clear areas of improvement uh, within the existing system and to make additional improvements to that system where we can. So. It's a, uh, part of it's historical due to systems that parts of the public service have been using previously uh, which are not compatible with one another and part of it is also about making the right and necessary capital investment into the right parts of the justice system to make sure that we create a system that is actually interlinked uh, and that will take time. But just very quickly on the issue of time and resources, if we as a justice committee see this as a, a crucial area for uh, improving the, the Crown Office uh, as a whole and also the uh, component parts, how could we scrutinise that? You know, will we be sat here in a year having similar concerns? What kind of timescales could you put on it and how big are the, resor the resource barriers? Well, uh, the resource barriers are significant. Um, uh, the justice strategy is already published, so it's a, a public available document uh, which is out there, which... Um, uh, so uh, I mean more implementation, really? Uh, for each individual organisation. So, for example, um, if it was in policing, it would be around the, uh, the IT infrastructure they're planning to take forward. Uh, if it was for the Crown, they would be able to set out what their plans are and what the details of those are. Uh, for, the, um, uh, for the Crown Office to set out those details as well. Yeah. Uh, what we would then do is that that's where the Justice Board would actually seek to actually make sure there's proper collaboration. So if the police were to say, we want to move towards having body-worn cameras for all of our police officers, is that that's an issue that could be explored at the Justice Board to then identify, well, what do we need to do in the Crown Office in order to help to make sure that we can support that technology <coughs> if you're going to make use of it? And for the Scottish Court and Tribunal Service who are on the Justice Board to then say, well, what do we need to put in the courts in order to help to support and enable that technology as well so that we are where we are making those types of investments we are getting a whole system approach to it uh, to try and get the biggest benefit out of it that we actually can, rather than one part of the justice system saying, we're going to invest in this piece of uh, technology, but actually the real benefits of it can't be realised because the other parts of the justice system haven't actually been able to adapt or to put in the capital infrastructure that's necessary to be able to utilise it or make the best use of it. No follow by Mary. Thank you. Yes, um, I wanted to ask what um, the implications of the decision to leave the EU might be. Um, and, and I know it's a matter of conjecture at the moment. Um, it's particularly in regard with co to cooperation between the Crown Office and partner agencies in Europe, and whether yourself and the Lord Advocate have had any discussions around this, and um, just what implications, what effect do you think it, it could have? Well, there's no doubt it could have a number of very serious and significant um, effects, not just on our, uh, not just on our uh, criminal justice system, but also on our uh, civil justice system as uh, well. I hosted a justice summit that brought together a whole range of different stakeholders. The Crown agent attended that on behalf of the, uh, of the Crown Office. The Lord Advocate in the past couple of weeks, couple of months, has already uh, uh, given a speech in Brussels, uh, setting out his concerns about uh, some of the real risks uh, in not being a member of the European Union. One of the most obvious is the use of European arrest warrants and the potential risk they are effectively a, 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 it's a, based on an extradition arrangement, uh, which uh, if we lost the, the average timescale for a European arrest warrant, uh, from it being issued to the person actually being apprehended is something in the region of around 40 to 42 days. Uh, an extradition can take uh, nine months plus. Uh, so it's a much more efficient, effective system in being able to repatriate individuals. And I think there's a, 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 there's a case where a European arrest warrant has been issued in Scotland and uh, the person has been apprehended within hours uh, in another uh, jurisdiction. So they allow much greater efficiency and it goes part to part of the challenge is that um, if we end up having to go down the route of having extradition treaties instead, uh, given the time frame that they take up and the court time 
that they take up as well. That will actually create and drive greater inefficiency in the system. Uh, and will create, uh, it will slow the process down and it will take up more court time and having to deal with extradition proceedings in a way that uh, we don't have to deal with at the present moment uh, as well. It will also have, um, uh, we'll also, from our, our justice system, we'll, uh, we, uh, and I welcome the fact that we've opted into uh, Europol, but we will no longer be able to be a, a full member of Europol once we come out of the European Union, which means that when it comes to joint investigation teams, uh, that we will not be privy to the same access to information and shared resources as a member of Europol, which when it comes to things like human trafficking uh, are extremely important, uh, just given the uh, international nature um, of that type of criminal activity, uh, dealing with serious and organised crime groups uh, across a, a pan-European basis. Uh, uh, Europol play a very important part in supporting that. And uh, Police Scotland of the police services in uh, the UK is one of the police services that makes the greatest use of uh, an organisation like uh, Europol. So, for example, we've got uh, officers embedded there within the UK uh, team, unlike the way it operates in England and Wales, where they have to go through the Home Office, etc., in order to access it. Here, Police Scotland are directly to the organisation, have direct access to their database systems um, as well. So we've got, we make very good use of Europol uh, uh, as well. So we will not have the same opportunities uh, that we have at the present moment uh, once we have left uh, Europol. Although we can be a, a tier two member, um, uh, you don't have the same access to uh, information and support as well. On the civil side, uh, it will potentially have a very significant uh, impact. There's areas around, for example, around commercial law uh, and contract law, uh, which again are, uh, have been agreed. There are, so for example, contracts which are agreed between uh, a company here. Cabinet Secretary, it's not relevant to this inquiry, civil matters, because it's the Crown Procurator. The question, the question, yeah, but the question was just about, yeah, uh -huh. but the question was just about uh, as, as the, the impact in it could have on it, yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, what it could have is that in commercial law, for example, uh, contracts between a company here in Scotland and a company in France, they can be enforced in the courts. Actually, if we no longer have as, or, uh, access to that, that will create uh, uh, difficulties. So uh, from the criminal through to the civil, through to uh, uh, commercial law, it will have a significant impact. Uh, and we've already been doing work around looking at uh, what the impact of that will actually be. Uh, and part of that is through engagement with stakeholders such as the uh, Justice Summit, which I hosted, and we'll continue to have that engagement in the weeks and months ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Is the reality, um, Cabinet Secretary, not that whether we're in or out the EU, it makes sense for Europe and uh, the UK to cooperate on the very issues that you, you've talked about, which prevent terrorism, trafficking, and that um, there's much to be gained by the very excellent facilities we've had, not least in Gertkosh, um, which I'm sure are recognised Europe-wide. Being a member of Europol? You Being just a member, be uh, just sharing, um, sharing data, sharing information, sharing intelligence, is, is make, will make common sense whether we're in the EU or out the EU? It certainly makes common sense. Part of the challenge will be is when we're out of the EU, we won't actually have that hub that is provided by Europol for the sharing of that information. So, and the coordination of that sharing of information as uh, well. So that's, that's part of the challenge. There's no doubt when we come out of Europe, we're still going to have to try and to find mechanisms in order to share and collaborate a uh, 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 on uh, given issues and uh, to work as best we can, but it will be a suboptimal way of doing it uh, than what we have at the present moment, which is a much more efficient and effective way of dealing with it and it allows, for example, uh, issues to be raised automatically and to have uh, direct access to then having to uh, uh, request information or uh, not having access to that information automatically uh, uh, where time can be of the essence. So, yeah, it will still be, be important, but it will be, certainly be a suboptimal, be less efficient and less effective than what we've got at the present moment. OK, thank you, Mary. Thank you. Um, can I just briefly ask you, Cabinet Secretary, about prosecution of health and safety cases? Because we heard some quite concerning evidence about the very low level of prosecutions <coughs> in health and safety cases. Um, the fact that health and safety cases are treated more like civil cases um, and there are often quite lengthy and protracted negotiations before the conclusion of a case. 
So are you content that prosecution of health and safety is robust enough? Um, there was a very effective case prosecuted by the Crown Office last week um, on health and safety, um, uh, which uh, attracted a significant uh, custodial sentence. Um, uh, that itself, I think, demonstrates the willingness and the ability mm. of the, the Crown Office to be able to prosecute these matters effectively. Uh, there is a, a unit within the Crown Office, I understand, that deals with health and safety matters. So there's a level of uh, expertise uh, there. I suspect part of the frustration can also come from some of the health and safety cases is the length of time that some of these can take in order to get to prosecution um, uh, and uh, where there are ways in which that can be uh, uh, speeded up, where there is a greater efficiency that could be achieved in that. And I think if there are ways in which that could be achieved, then that would be certainly welcome. How the Crown Office go about doing that, I'm afraid, is a matter for the Lord Advocate uh, mm. to determine how that uh, and the approach they take in order to achieve that. Um, uh, but I, you know, I can understand if there are frustrations around uh, some of the length of time it can take for uh, prosecutions in this area uh, uh, as well. But um, I think the case last week just demonstrates mm. that the Crown Office are able to prosecute these matters and as and when it's appropriate, they will do so. And uh, I think the penalty which was handed down by the court as well, I think sends out a very strong message about how the courts view uh, uh, serious breaches of health and safety as well. Yeah, I mean, I think last week's case was um, a, a really good example, as, as you've said, but health and safety cases can often cause quite significant distress to families um, that, that are involved in these cases, and there is no statutory, statutory time limit. Is that even something that you think should be reviewed? Um, I'm always, uh, you know, if there's, if there's a way in which... Um, uh, uh, we can improve the system, then I'm open to exploring that uh, and to uh, considering that. I think what I would say, first of all, though, is that um, I think it's important that the Crown Office are given an opportunity to explain the approach that they are taking uh, to these matters mm -hmm. and whether they believe that there are any changes which they can make that could help mm -hmm. to improve the way uh, in which they are handling these matters. If following that, there is a view that they are uh, is still further measures that need to be taken which require legislative change, uh, then I would, uh, I, I, you know, I'm open to considering those, uh, uh, those issues. But I think, it, in fairness, it would be only right for the Lord Advocate to be able to explain how they intend to deal with these matters and uh, where there are areas that they believe that they can improve and how they will go about achieving that, first okay. of all. Okay, thank you. I think in particular there was concern about the lack or um, very low prosecutions for those failing to have employer uh, liability insurance. Is that something you're aware of, Cabinet Secretary? Yeah, I have. Uh, I am aware of that and I have been made um, uh, aware of that. Again, the decisions in prosecuting in these matters is entirely a matter for the Lord Advocate and um, it would be, wrong for, it'd be long, wrong for government ministers to start to get into uh, setting out uh, uh, what they think should be happening in these matters. But um, no doubt the Lord Advocate will be able to explain uh, the reasons and also the approach that the Crown Office are taking in dealing with these issues. Well, in advance of the uh, Lord Advocate and coming in next week, there's only one final question, two final questions. Not Withstanding the independent status of the Crown Procurator Fiscal Service, would it be fair to say that the organisation would be failing in its duty if it did not take cognizance of the government's policies in relation to criminal justice matters? Um, well, I think it, it, it's for the Lord, the Lord Advocate will set out the approach which they will take. It, there's no doubt that there are, there are decisions which are made in a range of policy areas which will have an impact on the Crown Office and they will have to respond to those issues. So, for example, uh, the approach that has been taken around uh, tackling domestic and sexual violence has had an impact on the, the Crown Office um, and they've had to respond to that uh, uh, in order to uh, deal with these issues. So, um, I've got no doubt that the Lord Advocate uh, will uh, want to make sure that in uh, taking forward the Crown Office, that it is, it recognises where there are uh, priorities being set by Parliament uh, and uh, to make sure that as a Crown Office they're able to respond to those issues effectively. I think it's also worth keeping in mind as well is that some of the policy changes that have taken place are actually policy changes that have been driven by 
uh, at times been driven by the experience of procurator fiscals and the Crown Office. So, for example, in the domestic abuse issue, the uh, domestic abuse bill, which we've said we'll bring forward in this parliamentary session, uh, that came about uh, as a result of um, uh, uh, work that was carried out by Leslie Thompson, the former Solicitor General, uh, who was very clear that fiscals were having real difficulty in being able to uh, prosecute cases where coercion and psychological abuse uh, was taken forward and uh, they were of the view there need to be a legislative change in order to help to support fiscals in being able to actually deal with these issues. So, um, so I've got no doubt that they will be, uh, they will, uh, you know, they will recognise the priorities which are set by Parliament and by government in areas as well and will seek to respond to those effectively. But equally, as has happened in the past, I suspect the Crown Office will also want to set out areas where they want to see further change taking place in our criminal justice system and where they think there are gaps. And we will do our very best to try and help to work with them in addressing those issues as well. Well, just for the avoidance of doubt, and the final question, has the Cabinet Secretary had any discussions with the Lord Advocate in relation to wider prosecution policy or are these matters which are strictly off limits? Well, in terms of prosecution policy, that's a matter entirely for the Lord Advocate, uh, and that's the constitutional position, and it's a position which um, I will certainly respect as Cabinet Secretary for Justice, and I think it's appropriate that we, uh, uh, we respect the role that the Lord Advocate has in setting that policy. That concludes the questioning. Thank you very much for attending today. Um, we now move into private session. The next committee meeting will be on the 17th of January when we'll be hearing from the Lord Advocate himself in the final evidence session on the Crown Office inquiry and given, uh, giving consideration to current petitions.